Mm-hmm. It's just amazing. So if, if I could quickly say thanks, um, first of all, to, uh, to Ray Grant and George, uh, Joe, you, um, Caroline Prezan, uh, Lainey, um, you're, you're wonderful. Um, Sonar and Ben at Multiformat Network, and also to my wife, who's been by me um, through every step of this painful process, an arduous process, um, but also to all those who so gracious, graciously participated, uh, not the least of which um, the, the, the staff and doctors at LNA Masonic, uh, but especially uh, at Gunderson, where all of this in, in Friendship, Wisconsin, where yeah. all of this began, this journey began, uh, ironically, uh, in the month of May, a Stroke Awareness Month. Absolutely. So, you know, um, um, yeah, yeah, Bill, you know, it, it, it was, came quite as a shock, I think, to all of us who know and love you when this happened. And one of the things that you've mentioned that I wanted to ask you about uh, was that, you know, of all the small towns in Wisconsin that you could have been camping in, uh, you were in a town where there was a hospital that had a certified stroke center. Yep. And yeah, we were, we that, were about... that's so important? Yeah, we, well, we were about 10 miles out of town uh, camping in, in the woods of, of central Wisconsin, uh, adjacent to a, a tiny little town of 600. We went, uh, we went into town and grab some supplies. And I just happened to notice uh, that the night before that there was uh, there was a trauma center there. Okay. And I thought, okay. wow, it, you know, this is literally out in the middle of nowhere. Again, 600 people in, in the town of Friendship. And uh, not knowing that when I went to bed that night, I would wake up in the morning and need need that that care they were also a certified trauma or a stroke care unit right and so uh i knew enough i knew enough of of the symptoms and and uh about stroke care at least before you get to an emergency room to take to take some aspirin right um but then then i I put my hands and faith in doctors and, and staff at, at the Gunderson clinic and they, uh, they gave me an MRI and they, they, they took great care of me. Uh, I got to, I got to, uh, such great care of me that when I got to Chicago and stumbled out of a, out of a, out of a taxi, uh, into Illinois Masonic, literally banging into the doors um, because I, I, I couldn't walk, I, I, you know, I, or barely could walk. The, the nurse looked up at me at, at me and said, you must be Mr. Turk. Huh? Um, and it, it was almost six hours between between our, our, our checking in at, at Gunderson in Wisconsin and walking into or stumbling in, the zombie walking in, as I called it, uh, into uh, Illinois Masonic. Well, that's dramatic. Uh, but, you know, I know that yeah, <laughs> Illinois Masonic is also a fantastic hospital. Um, there you are. You've really been on this path of recovery. I know you've been giving it 150%. We've been seeing your progress on social media, that you are running, you're exercising, you're going to rehab, and that is so important. Um, I did want to ask, and I know that this is something you've brought up, and I know people after stroke or any kind of uh, brain injury where you oftentimes have a lot of exhaustion and that that's, uh, that can be a common after effect. But also we've talked a little bit about depression, and, and that's also a common but maybe not always understood uh, sim- uh, side effect that can happen after somebody has had a stroke. Um, for, first of all, let me let me just say say this uh, very quickly. Rich Maisel, uh, that that song Machu Picchu is is incredible. Um, I, I, I need to get a copy of that. Uh, <laughs> and Joe, you were my my dramaturg for the People's Republic of Edward Snowden. Mm. And and I remember I remember you sitting on the floor with the cast. Uh, and the, and the crew of that 
uh, as we as we went through uh, as we went through that script. And and actually, uh, you were all fundamental in in crafting the final version of that that script. So I just wanted to wanted to say thank you. And, and Lainey, uh, you were you are the voice of Chicago theater. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, so there, there's there's no, um, but to 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 your question, um, and and I, I have to give a shout out to a very very dear artist friend, uh, Diane Thodos, uh, who suffered uh, what what I suffered was an ischemic stroke. Um, she suffered uh, a similar a similar type of stroke a, a number of years ago. And so she, she gave me a timeline of recovery, something that the doctors either can't do or are reluctant to do because everybody's different sure. or, you know, they don't want to lock people into expectations. Uh, Diane was, was, was brilliant about, uh, about giving me, at least, at least from her perspective, a timeline on recovery and what to expect. Uh, when when I spoke to her on this, I still had maybe fifty percent use of my arm and my leg, um, my right arm and right leg, and so so she said because I, I complained to her about the fatigue. The fatigue factor is just almost overwhelming at times, and, and I'm I fight it every single day. Uh, but she said that that last that lasted her about a year, so I at least at least I knew that I, I was I was kind of normal in experiencing that. She also said to watch out for depression, and I've I've been there. Uh, it's it's unavoidable, and I, I'm not normally a depressed a depressed person. Um, and so I'm not sure if there's there's an emotional component or a physical component that that's driving it right now. Um, but one of the things that I've always I've always said, and we we used to talk about depression and mental distress. I I, I don't like to use the word mental illness because I think that's that's a uh, a net negative for for people and for 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 families or caregivers. Um, mental distress, um, but we've we've always talked about we we've, that that was a, a a part of our of our programming, an important part of our programming is is addressing those those aspects of of the community and the arts community. By the way, um, the the key to to overcoming depression is understanding that you have you have options and opportunities that there's a way, there's a way out of that seemingly endless tunnel. And one way I've, I've learned to deal with it is by, is by helping, helping others who are struggling with, with depression or mental distress issues uh, and, and kind of chronicling my, um, my recovery as, as a means of, of self-critique and, and self-therapy and self-coaching. Uh, I hope that makes, I hope that answers the question. I hope that makes some sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I appreciate that. I know other people who are listening are going to appreciate that yeah. as well. Uh, that's important to know about that. And, you know, you got, mm -hmm. I think, some really excellent care, and you had friends around you with experience. Yeah. Not everybody yeah. has that. Right. And right. so this gives you gives these people material that they can use yeah. when they need to advocate for themselves. We are going to be, yeah. you know, we've, we've taken up a lot of time with you, or not enough time with you, enough of your time here. But <laughs> I do want to say uh, you've got a lot of pro other projects going on right now, Bill. You've got your, you got your podcast. Um, yeah. And you've got some other writing projects. Do you want to just briefly tell folks about that? Yeah, and and one of the reasons that Rich Maisel's uh, Machu Picchu song resonated so strongly with me, um, and and not the least of which was the imagery as well, uh, is that I'm I've been researching a book called uh, A History of Light for the Artist, where I talk about the ascending steps 
in our evolutionary progress. And at every step that is driven by, by artistic expression and cultural achievement um, and, and war and violence and division have, have, been, have, been, have been an impedance to those, to those steps. I'm trying to tell that better story on, on the critical nature of culture and the arts in our, in our evolutionary process, which by the way, is, is born out in, um, uh, in, in, by anthropologists who are now coming to the realization that, uh, that our cultural and artistic um, evolution is now a driver of our physical evolution far greater and far faster than, uh, than Darwinian uh, or biological uh, evolution, which is, which is astounding and, and says a lot about, about our, our humanity. Um, I'm also, also working on a couple of screenplays with, um, with George. We're, we're in the process of trying to sell those. So. Well, I'm looking. Still, I'm still here. Yeah, still no, here in I the mean, we're, we're looking forward. We're, we're <laughs> delighted that you are still here. We're delighted that you're still pushing forward and creating um, and supporting the arts, uh, but also creating your own art. And I'm, right. I'm going to be saying up some prayers for those uh, screenplays because uh, I'd sure and like if, to see if them I could, being performed. I mean, they're great. In my if I could also do a, a quick shout out to, um, to, uh, to the folks at the Chicago Writers Association that I host a monthly podcast yep. for them um, that uh, is, is for and about the art and craft of business and business of, of writing. Um, and that th we've, we've done some incredibly uh, important um, interviews and, uh, and, and had some great conversations. We'll continue, we'll continue to do, to do that. And I just uh, donated a couple of paintings, which was part of my recovery as well. Um, to uh, to a very very dear friend, uh, Nancy Rotering, the mayor of Highland Park. Yes. Uh, Highland yeah. Highland Park strong uh, after the uh, the terrible terrible tragedy um, that uh, that they experienced on on July fourth, and um, so that that's been that's been a, another aspect of, of my recovery uh, is uh, is the arts. And, and you've been doing magnificent work um, on Facebook. I've been seeing Bill's uh, mm. paintings, yeah. which are really, really extraordinary. Uh, and I've been saying you. we need to have an art show uh, <laughs> with, 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 with Bill. Maybe we can make that happen at some well, point. Bill's the type of guy oh, that wonderful. did fights. He's yeah. a fighter. And I've said this to him. And yeah. he's, on, he's doing things. He, he refuses to yeah. not fight. And no, no, I'm going to come, I'm gonna come back from this. Thank you, brother. I'm I'm gonna come back from this. Uh, I've you know I, I'm still fighting the fatigue factor. Yep. Uh, my therapists wanted me to to run because running was so important to me. Uh, but I can't I can't run very far, and I still have this clumpy, uh, lopsided <laughs> lopsided run. Um, but I found that rather than running any distance that doing, I, I, I reverting to my, my old track and cross country days, running intervals is a way of, of nudging that, mm -hmm. uh, that fatigue aspect, um, farther and farther. So uh, uh, Bill, you would that's, like to know that's that where I am. I think we still have Mr. Terry Kirkman. And why don't we bring Terry on and Bill stay there. We're going to have a right. phone call. Terry. Oh. And you can talk to Terry. <laughs> let me let me just say very, very quickly uh, again, um, I want to thank you, you. You did a spectacular job of, uh, of bringing up so many great guests, George. Um, that uh, Michael O'Sable, uh, and Michael, if you're listening, uh, I, I, I sent you again uh, a link to the, uh, 
uh, to the podcast. I got great, uh, great reviews uh, when I posted it, and congratulations great on movie. the uh, the mulligan. on the video. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, Douglas Bean, what what can I say, man? That that voice is just gold That's alone. Butter, Terry, Terry. Wait, 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 I guess they're working on it. Can you hear us, Terry? Join audio, Terry. Join audio. Hi, Terry. Yep. Looks like he's he's connecting to his his audio. Hi, Hi Terry. Hi. Am I on video? No, you're you just are. on uh, uh, audio. The phone. Audio. And that's it for the oh, wait whole a minute, show. I see your name there. I mean, <laughs> I see your the picture, but not your. I don't see your face, but I see your name. So maybe they're working on that. Is he on? Can he can he get on video? You can hear us. All right. Yeah, Terry okay. W. No, there WC you go. Turk oh, that's Bill. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Terry W. C. C. Right. Turk here. Thank you. Thank you so much. You know, I grew up. I grew up listening to to the association. Um, I, I I know you. Uh, you're friends with Rufan uh, Friedman, and we've been working on trying to to connect. Uh, uh, but and 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 she wrote famously wrote Windy. Um, but you know, I, I grew up listening to you guys and you were, you were such an important part. You're so iconic, uh, in, in American music, but in pop music. And, and I just wanted to say thank you so much for, uh, for this opportunity. The way, um, I, I, I heard that you're recovering as well from, from an injury and I wish you Godspeed in, uh, in Hey, Terry, well, thank I, you. I, Terry, you I wanted me? to, first of all, tell the audience, of course, you're the co-founder of the association, a, a real iconic 60s group. You know, when I, when I, and I grew up during that time, and I remember the association having those wonderful uh, harmonies. Um, it must have been very hard, not hard, I guess you had all the talent, for, to get those six voices to be perfect pitch. How did, I, and I read somewhere that you guys used to, just do a heck of a lot of practicing before you went on the road. Um, can you can you expound on that? It's a lot of hard work. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm serious. I agree. Uh, people look back at that time of music, and uh, and they, and they, it was a product. So what you got was. A, a product that was put, put, put forth to the public. Uh -huh. That product, which you received, had not existed as a genre of music before. Yes. So what happened in the 60s, particularly with the folk groups out of, out of the Western United States, Virtually all of the, the successful bands that came out in 64, 65, 66, 67 from the West Coast had all been folk singers before. So there was a lot of attention paid to the harmonies that you were singing. And we weren't singing doo-wop like East Coast guys were, guy, girl. And we weren't singing... Uh, Oh, I, I don't know what genre you would put it in. Sort uh, of the Motown thing with the dancing and the coordinating. You know, more like the girls dance. You know, my boyfriend's back. You're going to get in trouble kind of jingle songs is, is yeah, what I, yeah. think, I think of them. And also think that, that later on, certainly some of the stuff that we sang was jingly in genre. Mm -hmm. But originally we were... We didn't know what we were looking for. We had been uh, greatly influenced by a group that uh, Jerry, uh, Jim Yester's brother Jerry was in, which was called the Monopole Quartet. Mm -hmm. and I, had see, I had heard them the first week that they ever performed in Waikiki, uh, Honolulu, Hawaii. And... Uh, 
I didn't know what to do with them myself. I when they when they first came to California, if they were at the Troubadour or local club singing, I would actually swoon, and then I'd have to run out of the club, and I would just run because I didn't know what to do with myself. I I didn't have a group. I I didn't have a group to go run back and do. I just I just knew that that was the sound, and and that was also the sound historically. The, Almost no one I ever meet uh, factors in, unless you're in the music business. You it's, know, there was a jazz, there was a jazz folk group called the Four Freshmen. Yes. Uh-huh. And the Four you know, Freshmen. I, we, spoke with, um, we spoke with Colin Blundstone uh, from the Zombies on, on the show. Uh, another band who was also known for, for their great harmonies. And, and that was part of the conversation uh and uh, so i'm i'm just supporting what you're saying here is is that you you guys were forging all new ground like you said there there there's a there was a foundational difference between the harmonies that you were doing and and uh, uh barbershop quartet harmonies uh you know or or is some of the some of the simpler harmonies that that motown artists were doing or even even some of the some of the harmonies that the 60 uh, the, the the 50s and 40s musicians were doing um the, this was this was a whole new style of singing and harmonization that you guys uh you guys were were pioneers of yes that's the uh, point the point the point that I was trying to make yeah. Uh, so the, the, it had never been done before. The association was passed on by every major record company on the West Coast. Wow. wow. We had a standing fan club in Los Angeles alone of 20,000 people. Mm-hmm. We, could mm-hmm. sell, we could sell out a good sized club in, in a week, uh, three months in advance. Uh, wow. So we got to the door, we could sell the club out in a week for a week for a week stand, not just a night, but for a whole week, sell out a week of tickets for a club uh, three months in advance. And we couldn't get a record contract because while everybody knew that it was an exciting town and would actually do things to you when you first heard it, as it did to us, it was all a surprise to us. We were as, we were as surprised as you were. That it, that it worked in the way that it did. The record companies could not bring themselves to give us a contract because marketing was not set up to to identify what the genre was. Yeah. They were afraid that because there was nothing that sounded like it, that it didn't fit uh, who they were selling to. The irony now is looking looking back that you guys defined not only the genre but the era. I've you know, never Terry, heard I that. Read that you re- you wrote "Cherish" in one half hour. Is that correct, sir? In in what in what time limit? In a half in thirty minutes. Yeah, that's my story. Yeah, I'm sticking to it. <laughs> 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 All right. <laughs> well, let me tell you, recorded by the association, released in 1966, reached number one on the U.S. Billboard 100 for the entire year of 1990, it's 1966, Billboard, Billboard ranked it number two. Also, a certified gold in 1966, uh, number one in Canada. And uh, I mean, what, what must be? I think this is. Uh, in fact, Bill told me this uh, that at his prom, uh, the only song he danced to was "Cherish." Yep. How That's did that it. come about, Bill? <laughs> How come you didn't <laughs> dance? Uh, it was it was the perfect tempo for me not to completely embarrass myself. <laughs> It's not a very danceable song. <laughs> you know, that, Terry, not that's the kind dance- of song that when you're on, you're See, driving in a car. No, I, 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 I found it 
eminently danceable. Um, and I could, it was, it was the right tempo that I could keep both eyes solidly on both of my feet and not step on my, uh, my dates. So Terry, you're, you're from really Salinas, Kansas. Is that correct, sir? Oh, I'm from Salina, Kansas. I'm another white guy who dances like he does. Right? Uh, <laughs> good man, and, good uh, man. I read that you uh, then went, you, you had a salesman job in Hawaii, sir? Uh, yeah, you're jumping around and my head has to catch up with you. <laughs> uh, I, I, I was in Kansas for about two and a half minutes. Uh, and then my folks moved right here where I'm living right now. I mean, four miles from where I'm living right now. All right. Uh, before World War II. And then and, uh, the next question you had was 1962, my first run away from home. I didn't know what I was going to do. I hadn't finished college at all. I was uh, really a mess. And... Uh, not drugs or anything, just emotionally yeah. kind of lost. And I, I moved to Hawaii in 1962, just in time for the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis, which was the last place on earth he wanted to be. Wow. It, it was Honolulu or Pearl Harbor, if you had the Cuban Missile Crisis. We were called the first goodbye. Yeah. Uh, Aloha! <laughs> Boom! <Yeah. laughs> um, a a witness to history, but but you also ended up making history. Oh yeah, you uh, when you came I met, to Cal that's where I met Jules, my co-founder of everything. Yeah, yeah. He, he, was he was in the Navy, Navy, wasn't he? He was in the Navy. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. that's where Larry came from. We we the group uniquely all by a just coincidence has pretty strong roots uh -huh. uh, with Hawaii. And then Good when music. you came to California, I read you, you and Jules uh, were in a group called the men. That's that's the, we accident, accidentally, the, 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 there was a Monday night hootenanny, which if you don't know the word hootenanny out there, huh. uh, is an op <laughs> open mic night and uh, in folk music. And it had become a uh, showcase night at the Troubadour. Wow. And the Troubadour was arguably the most powerful club in the United States for, for some time. And uh, certainly on the West Coast, you didn't come to the West Coast unless you did, unless you paid homage and to yeah. the Troubadour, to the folk club. But that's where Elton John, that's where Neil Diamond, everybody had to play the Troubadour. So uh, we we set up a uh, an actual folk music jam thing, and because we needed a name, Doug Dillard, the great uh, banjo player from the group The Dillards, um, said we're called the Inner Tubes. So we got a thing. and everybody would be in the inner tube. So uh, for weeks, uh, it was it was a sing along, and we'd have twenty some odd people on stage. Wow! And uh, Spanky McFarland and Cass Elliott and God. David, uh, you know, everybody just get up, you know, grab your instrument and sing some songs, and everybody would stand around. It was wonderful. It was like a Christmas carol thing. Sure. Everybody was singing. Uh, Good times, right? Doug, Doug Weston sent a, 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 an emissary asked if we wanted to make it a uh, a real deal, and um, thirteen guys responded, no women, and so he called it the men, and he paid us a uh, a bit and gave us access to the Troubadour kitchen, and we began to rehearse. At the very same time that we were rehearsing in the big room, the uh, bee feeders who became the birds, <laughs> who desperately wanted to be British, uh, they were rehearsing in the, in the bar in the, in the front. So history was, history unintentionally was being made by leaps and bounds. It, wow. it, at that time in the Troubadour on a Monday night, on a hoot night in the Troubadour, 
unbeknownst to anybody else, there would have been uh, 25 people on any night that were soon to become droppable names in a music history. It was very, very exciting. Nobody knew what we were doing. It sounds think, like a uh, great time. I think I think the birds very nearly achieved becoming British, uh, but uh, how how did you how did you you guys finally arrive at the name the association? Weather's been told. <laughs> Do you know the showbiz story, the aristocrats? Yeah. <laughs> I do. Yeah. That's you know, how. It's one of it's one of these mythologies. Um, I, I remember speaking with uh, with a couple of people who were at the table uh, when they when they came up or or supposedly came up with the uh, with the name Led Zeppelin. Uh, and but I've 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 heard each of these various people tell different versions of the of this of the story um, with with them at the center. So I just wanted to. I just wanted to hear, um, hear, hear how you uh, how how you thought that came about. We had a rehearsal at the at the men, uh, uh -huh. the, which the large group was called, and and we were doing well. Like just like the association later, we could sell a club out in a, in a nanosecond. Uh, it was, and we were the first group in the United States that we know of to ever be called folk rock, and. Uh -huh. And the birds were the first group that we know of in the United States to be successful under the title of folk rock. Wow. Uh, we broke up. Uh, I was the leader. The group was arguing. We were in a really nice rehearsal location in Larchmont Village in Hollywood. And uh, I said, I'm, I'm not going to I'm not going to be stuck in between. But you know, number one, I'm liable because I'm the signed leader with the union. But I I I. I I don't want to do this because we don't have, a, we're a great group. This is really exciting. We had drums uh -huh. and electric bass and electric guitar, and we had actually influenced Dylan to uh, have an electric guitar uh, after a show one night at the Troubadour. He stayed and we played around. And so we're, we're in this amazing world. We can't get arrested. And I've got 11 guys, hmm. and that's a lot of mouths to be and a lot of rent to pay. And uh, so I just walked out. Five other guys walked out with me. Uh, we went to my apartment where huh. my, fian my fiance was and uh, uh, Melrose Place was where the apartment was. And okay. we're sitting down and saying, uh, what the fuck did we just do? Uh, <laughs> you know, what, what did we do? And somebody said, don't look now, but there's six of us. There's two basses, two baritones, two tenors. We're a group. And you know, so we're getting stoned. And we said, well, <laughs> what would we call ourselves? And we started bouncing joke names around. and said, let's call ourselves the aristocrats. And Brian Cole, the etymologist, he said, I, I wonder what aristocrats really means. And my fiance had just won on a game show one of these huge 6,000 page dictionaries uh, and all that. So she's looking up aristocrats and she lands on the word the association. And that's the story. Wow. Wow. Huh. And, and that's well, the what you, what, you, what you don't know is the kind of sex acts the association could perform. <laughs> you know, I'm very you know, interesting. We'll, uh, interested we'll, we'll leave that in, for, the, in, for the late night show. Okay. Call me up. <laughs> Terry, Sounds how good. did you get into becoming a drug counselor, sir? A drug counselor? Yeah. Practice. <laughs> Practice. <laughs> so you went from a rock and roll to a drug counselor. I, I find that admirable. And I read that you were counseling artists to get through recovery. And, and so if you can just tell us a little bit about that uh, journey. I, the, the drug counselor and then the word artist came in. Yeah. You were a drug counselor for the artist's recovery. Is that correct? Oh, no. Oh. So I, be, I, became, I became clinical director of a uh, wonderful 
uh, nonprofit called the Musicians Assistance Program, which has now been absorbed. Okay. And has been for years absorbed into the Grammy Foundation. And we were oh. like we were like a uh, occupational specific HMO. We were the funders, which was really fun. It was really fun to be on the other end of the the bargaining stick with hospitals and recovery places. And all, all told, I was blessed with helping people in 46 states and 13 countries. Wow. But most of all, uh, I got sober. I got clean and sober. I'm, I'm coming up on 38 years clean and sober. My wife is coming up on 36. Mm -hmm. And uh, I got sober in 1984, six weeks after I left the band for the last time. And uh, I was really suicidal. I wow. was devastated. I was mortified. I, I just, oh, Jesus, it was horrible. And uh, cocaine and booze was the primary thing with me. Mm -hmm. And uh, I went to my first AA meeting. Now it just broke my anonymity. Anonymity, forgive me out there. Nobody give me hate mail. Uh, went to my first AA meeting and uh, uh, totally suicidal. I could not stop. I mean, I couldn't stop doing what I was doing. And I went to my first meeting. I never had another drink. I never smoked another joint. Okay. I never had a line of Coke. You know, God just bless. bam. I was uh, I was struck sober in some kind of spiritual context. Hmm. So in 1984 in Hollywood was like the gold rush for for 12 step programs. There were jokes on television every night that you couldn't get a role in a television show unless you were in a 12 step program. Mm -hmm. uh, that we'd become like the mafia of. Uh, of that, that, but that's how many people were getting sober all at one time. And mostly that was from cocaine and speed and quaalude and drugs that would just take you down like, uh, you know, like you've been hit by a hurricane. But uh, so it was a very, it was a very exciting place to be in the artist world because people were transforming right before your eyes. And, uh, I, was, I was in one meeting, my, my, my first sponsor was Doug Fleiger. My first real sponsor was Doug Plugger, who was much younger than I am and only a year more sober than I. But he wrote uh, My Sharona with the Knack. And, uh, yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. Let's see, but that's Doug Flagler from the Knack, right? Yeah. And brilliant mind. I mean, total retention. He could have gone on Jeopardy. <laughs> uh, one, of the, one, of, one of those brain things. And uh, I was sitting in a room with him on a Wednesday night. There was about 40 people in the room waiting for a meeting to start. And I said, I think there's about 12 record, gold and platinum records in this room, Doug. And Doug says, is there? And he looks up, he looks around and says, make that about 27. <laughs> and, but I say that because, you know, you're in Hollywood and all of Hollywood is getting sober all at one time. So it was stunning, but I became, I became really introspective about the issues of being a creative person, a person who's compelled, driven to want to do something yeah. uh, in the creative context. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know uh, uh, how is life for you now? I, I know you're doing some drawings that I see on Facebook that are very interesting. Uh, it reminded me of somebody my wife and I met here in Chicago who. Uh, Ezra Siegel, uh, very similar. Um, how how is life for you and your wife uh, today? Uh, you talked about her drawings. Yeah, those are my drawings. Oh, I know that. Yeah, they're uh, great. They're I interesting. Don't, I, I don't. I don't think she had a. Uh, we're good. We're both retired. We're living someplace uh, 40 miles outside of LA that is not all that comfortable for us, but we're very, very blessed that we own the house and we own the car and all of our all of our problems of our great abundance. And I just went through a thing where I 
broke my left arm just above the elbow and went through the long yeah. healing thing involved with that. And two weeks after I got the cast off, I broke the same arm again at the shoulder and uh, from falling. And uh, I'm just getting over that. I just began physical therapy for this. It's, it's been a very hard year for us, a very hard year for her because all of a sudden she was swept into the role of being my major caretaker. Right. And, uh, well, you know, uh, I'm saying, I'm saying uh, hold on one second, I'm saying goodbye to her. She goes out the door to quaff uh, her hair. Uh, goodbye, my love. Say yeah. goodbye. Where are you guys? What state are We're you? We're in guys? Evanston, Illinois, Terry. Yeah. We're in a studio Evanston. called WCGO. Oh. Have you been out this way before? I'm sure you have. Chicago was our home away from home. So wow. Illinois is a big deal. What city did you say? Well, this this is in Evanston, but I live in Deerfield, which is close to Ravinia. Ah. And I know you kicked it there in 1967. <laughs> we broke the Kingston Trio's attendance record. Wow. Oh. Wow, that's saying something. Yeah. 1967, oh, wow. the association. Something. Before you go, I want to mention to you that we're also playing Everything That Touches You, which was released, it says here in 1968. Uh, how did that how did that song come to you? How, what was the because it your music is so great to listen to. It it, it uplifts you. I, I, I'm just curious about that song. Well you, cherish, I received uh, Cherish. I received uh, Enter the Young. I, uh, I would just be driving along and I would start singing a song as though I had learned it that day and wow. I was singing, but it was coming out of my mouth, though, which wasn't the thing with, with Cherish or. Wow. Enter the, young, Enter the Young came to me while I was opening a can of cream style corn. Um, <laughs> Incredible. Originally, originally, it was Beware the Young. Um, when, I, I, when I was traveling, I, you know, you're sitting on a bus, you're sitting on an airplane, you're sitting in the backseat of a car, or you're driving, or whatever, and it's just hours of just sitting. yeah, And so I would start to re receive all of us, anyone who's a writer, you think about recipes for the night, you think about what you're gonna buy for Christmas if you're not a songwriter, you know, you receive things. And yeah. uh, so I'd get these snippets of, uh, of, of lyrics, the little snippets of Incredible. melody lines, little grooves, and you didn't have a cell phone in those days to record it immediately. Right. Uh, and I don't, I don't notate. And uh, so I would come home. It was sort of, sort of like, uh, 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 who's the the famous East Coast women's book, Emily Dickinson. Who would write mm -hmm. things on your paper and that kind of stuff? Well, right. that was me. I would write any paper, a barf bag on the plane, uh, <laughs> back back of a ticket holder, anything. I you know, a piece of newspaper, and I'd stuff them in a pocket on a canvas bag, a shoulder bag I carried. And when I got home, we were going to this album, and I really didn't have anything, and we had had built for us a in Mexico, we had a large library table. It was really, really cool. Yeah. Um, set up and uh, I dumped all that stuff out on the top of, of the library table. And I started sorting it out thematically, like in love, out of love, <laughs> um, spiritual. These are just the genres of Pop song, amazing. Uh, spiritual, fun, uh, whatever. Um, Terry, uh, let me just interject here very quickly. We could talk to you all day. Um, these are these are amazing stories, and and 
Uh, it's it's taking me uh, on a trip through through my life and my my musical journey as well. So um, just so I get this in, I, I just wanted to say thank you, thank you, thank you. First of all, for for years, so many years of of great music. Um, the association was was foundational to my to my music uh, musical upbringing, um, and then thank you so much for being for being here today. Cherish is a word I use to describe all the feeling that I have fighting here for you inside. Someone who could cherish me as much as I cherish you Perish is a word that more than a blood To the hope in my heart each time I Cherish as much as I do yours. Oh, I'm beginning to think that man has never found the words that could make you want me, that have the right amount of letters, just the right sound that could make you hear, make you see that you are driving me out of my mind. Say I need you, but then you'd realize that I want you just like a thousand other guys would say they love you with all the rest of their lives when all they wanted was to touch your face, your hands, and gaze into your eyes. Cherish is the word I use to. Describe all the feeling that I have writing here for you inside. You don't know how many times I wish that I had told you. You don't know how many times I wish that I could hold you. You don't know how many times I wish that I could mold you into someone who could cherish me as much as I. Cherish you and I do. Cherish you and I do. Cherish you. Cherish is the Spending those moments with